uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about is, is joint work mostly with Dermot Crowley and uh, Sebastian Goethe. So uh, the, the topic is Riemannian metrics on seven manifolds whose Riemannian holonomy group is G2. So I, I understand that uh, the audiences may be more focused on algebraic geometry, but I'll, I'll give a little bit of background on what, what that means. But the, what, the work I'm going to talk about is how to use various versions of a construction that starts from complex algebraic objects um, and then uses that to produce examples of closed seven manifolds with uh, Riemannian holonomy G2. And then studies various topological and geometric uh, properties of those examples. So for instance, one can show things like the existence of closed seven manifolds where the moduli space of holonomy G2 metrics is disconnected. So the, the rough uh, structure is that first I want to give a little bit of background of what uh, holonomy G2 means. Then I want to present some of the most interesting features of the examples that we found. And then I want to get on to talking about the actual construction, the so-called twisted connected sum construction to start with. Um, because it's a, a more algebraic audience, I also want to spend a bit more time than I normally would talking about the, the technical heart of the construction, which is how to match the pieces in the construction together. This boils down to understanding some precise details about moduli spaces of K3 surfaces. And then I want to talk about the uh, more recent generalization of the twisted connected sum construction, where you take these pieces from complex algebraic geometry and you make sure they have some extra automorphisms that allow you to make the construction more complicated so that you can uh, exhibit more interesting topological phenomena. And then finally, if there's time, uh, I'll say something about the how to define the invariance that you use to distinguish between the examples. So starting with the sort of context for the talk, um, if you have a Riemannian metric on a on an n-dimensional manifold, then you can consider the action of parallel transport around closed loops, parallel transport by the Levitch-Vita connection of the Riemannian metric. So if you take parallel transport around all closed loops based at a particular point, and that gives you what's known as the holonomy group. So for a generic metric, you will get any element of ON or SON that way, depending on whether the manifold is orientable or not. Uh, but if for some very special metrics, you might get a smaller subgroup. So if you had a flat metric, for instance, the, this group would be trivial or discrete. So Berger proved that actually there's, uh, if you sort of look at the prime holonomy groups, then uh, there's only a very short list of those. So if your Riemannian metric is somehow indecomposable, so it's complete and simply connected, and in addition, it's not uh, and it's not not a product, and it's not a symmetric space. Then the only possibilities are given in this list. So the special orthogonal group corresponds to, is the generic case, uh, but you could also have the unitary group, which corresponds to Kähler metrics. You could have the special unitary group, which corresponds to Ricci flat Kähler metrics, and you also have two families that appear in dimension divisible by four. So these are the hyper Kähler metrics and the quaternion Kähler metrics. And finally, you have two exceptional cases. So there's a, in dimension seven, you could, it's one possibility is that you could have a holonomy group isomorphic to G2. And in the dimension eight, you could have holonomy group spin seven, uh, spin seven acting on eight dimensional spaces by the spin representation. And these exceptional cases are also defined Ricci flat metrics. So what is the group G2? Well, the group G2 is a 14-dimensional Lie group. In some ways, the most natural way to describe it is that it's the automorphism group of the Octonian algebra. So the Octonian algebra is the, if you, if you start with the real numbers and you double to get the complex numbers and you double that to get quaternions, then the Octonian algebra is the step you get after that. So any automorphism must fix the sort of real line inside the Octonians. So the automorphism group acts on the imaginary part of the Octonians. So that way you can think of the automorphism group of the Octonians being a subgroup of SO7. Another way to describe it that's convenient for doing differential geometry is that the state is of the 
alternating three form on uh, a seven dimensional scale. So basically you get this alternating three form by sort of taking the multiplication table on the imaginary octonians. So interestingly, this, um, this three form has an open orbit in uh, the space of all three forms. So that means that if you take a three form like this and you deform it a little bit, then you're still going to have something to stabilize isomorphic to G2. So you can define a G2 structure on a seven manifold in terms of a differential three form that every point is sort of looks like the standard three form, and that's a condition that's open under perturbing the three form. So if you have a G2 structure three form and you perturb it a little bit, it still defines the G2 structure. Now, because G2 is a subgroup of SO7, that means it's going to induce a Riemannian metric. And the condition that the metric has holonomy contained in G2 can be rephrased as saying that the metric has to be induced by a G2 structure that satisfies a first order partial differential equation called the torsion free condition. So, in terms of the three form, it can be written just as the three form being closed and co closed. The problem is this is actually a non linear partial differential equation because when you the co-closed condition involves the metric and the metric itself also depends on the three form. But anyway, whenever you have a torsion free T2 structure, it is in particular closed. It, uh, that means you can define a cohomology class in the Durand cohomology. Now, an interesting question is, once you fix a closed seven manifold, how many different G2 structures are there? So you could look at the space of all torsion-free GT structures and divide by the action of the diffeomorphism group of the manifold. So that moduli space is a little bit complicated to work with, but um, it's slightly easier if you just divide out by the identity component of the diffeomorphism groups, then you get some kind of Teichmüller space. And uh, so proper moduli space is a locally finite quotient of that Teichmüller space. So if one just looks at the Teichmüller space, then the, if you just look at the identity component of the different morphisms, then that will preserve the Durham cohomology class represented by closed three form. So you can map this Teichmüller space to the third Durham cohomology, and that is in fact a local homeomorphism. So one understands a lot about what this moduli space looks um, locally, but it's very hard to figure anything out about the global properties because basically because the partial differential equation that defines torsion for GT structures is uh, difficult. So actually it took a very long time. So Berger's work was from dates back to the 50s. So he sort of recognized the, that he couldn't rule out the possibility of Riemannian metrics with holonomy G2. But it wasn't until the 80s that um, Robert Bryan found the first examples of uh, metrics with holonomy G2. So it's really quite hard to find any examples at all. When you look at when you try to find examples of closed G2 manifolds, then the the way those are constructed are by different kinds of gluing arguments. So you kind of try to find some kind of degenerate holonomy G2 um, metric, some some kind of singular space, and then you try to resolve the singularity or something like that. So that way you get holonomy G2 metrics that are very close to degenerating in some way. So if you think of the degenerate G2 metrics as some kind of boundary points of this G2 moduli space, then the existing constructions basically understand something about some kind of color neighborhood of the boundary at best. So a short survey of um, what the constructions that we have for closed G2 manifolds. So the first examples come from uh, 1990s by Dominic Joyce. So he considered taking a flat torus and then dividing by an automorphism group. So you get uh, some singular flat thing. Uh, if you take the right kind of automorphism group, then you can think of that as a singular but flat G2 manifold. And then you can try to resolve the singularities to get a smooth G2 manifold. So you generate a lot of examples that way, but it's not always so easy to understand much about the topology of the results. So you can compute some better numbers, but maybe, maybe you can't go so far beyond that. Um, later in the early 2000s, Alexei Kovalev uh, implemented the twisted connected sum construction. So what you do there is you cook up some asymptotically cylindrical color BR threefolds. Those have holonomy SG3, so that does give you six-dimensional manifolds with holonomy SG3, which is a subgroup of G2, 
you take two of those and multiply them by circles and glue together, and then you try to construct a closed GT manifold that way. So that gives uh, a lot of examples, and one can understand a lot more about the topology from those, provided you know enough about the algebraic, complex algebraic objects as you start with, you can figure out a lot of, about the topology of the resulting GT manifold. Um, the only problem, in a way, is that it turns out that a lot of those manifolds kind of look the same, so um, it's not so easy to use those man just those manifolds to illustrate, um, exhibit interesting phenomena. Uh, another recent construction is sort of a variation of Joyce's construction, where instead of resolving quotients of a flat torus, you resolve quotients of a clabiard times a circle. Um, but so far, the, that construction hasn't actually been used in anger to construct new topological types. And finally, there's um, a recent, this recent modification of a twisted connected sum construction where you um, take some quotients by finite groups before gluing together the asymptotic cylindrical pieces. So here, the supply of examples that you can get out of that is a little bit limited. Um, but the topological features that it can have becomes a lot more varied than in the ordinary twisted connected sum construction. Any questions so far? Yes, could I just make sure that I understand it correctly? So the first <clears throat> example, the T7, is that an algebraic like C star, or is it a S1, a compound? No, ju oh. just just a product of seven copies of S1. Okay, thanks. So the one of the difficulties in um, studying holonomy G2 compared with the other special holonomy groups is that a lot of the other special holonomy groups sort of have a close relationship to, to complex manifolds, meaning that it gives you sort of a somewhat straightforward way to apply techniques from um, complex geometry. But in G2, they live on odd dimensional manifolds, so it's the relationship is sort of a bit less direct. So what you can do is you can try to glue together pieces that are sort of complex times something odd dimensional flat. That's sort of the best you can do in terms of relating it to complex geometry. Thanks. Okay, so here are some sort of the main, the main interesting phenomena that we can exhibit using this construction is we can find sort of exotic pairs of G2 manifolds. So we can find pairs of smooth seven manifolds such that both smooth seven manifolds admit holonomy G2 metrics, but um, the manifolds are not homeo uh, not diffeomorphic. So they're homeomorphic, but not diffeomorphic. So you have basically you have the same topolog underlying topological manifold. You can put two different smooth structures on it, and you get holonomy G you have holonomy G2 metrics on both those smooth structures. Another interesting phenomenon is that you can have um, a smooth closed seven manifold that admits two different holonomy G2 metrics. Different in the sense that when you look at the associated torsion free G2 structures, you can't deform one G2 structure to the other, not even not even to a path of G2 structures that are not torsion free. So that means that there's kind of a topological obstruction to, um, to these holonomy G2 metrics being in the same component of the moduli space. So in particular, this gives you examples where the G2 moduli space is disconnected. So that's kind of the first examples where you have um, uh, know some global information of what the moduli space looks like. And another interesting class of examples is you can find situations where you have holonomy G2 metrics are in different components of the moduli space, even though you can actually prove that it's possible to deform one torsion-free G2 structure to another through non-torsion-free GT structures. So if you could deform one to the other through torsion-free GT structures, they would have to be in the same component of the moduli space. But you can have situations where there is a deformation through non-torsion-free GT structures, but you can prove that you don't have uh, deformation through torsion-free GT structures. So basically, the, the tools that you need in order to prove these things is you need some invariants that are capable of distinguishing different things. You need to be able to generate lots of examples and compute all the invariants. And then you need some kind of classification results that allow you to show that you know, different examples are equivalent up to a point, but not beyond that. 
and those classification results work best for in the the easiest to prove in the two connected setting meaning that you work with seven manifolds where they're simply connected but also the second homotopy group vanishes and luckily the twisted connected sum and extra twisted connected sum constructions are capable of producing a lot of two connected examples so quick survey of the invariance so if we restrict attention to two connected seven manifolds where the fourth cohomology is torsion free then they're basically just two obvious algebraic invariant topological invariants left so one is the the third better number which is the same as the fourth better number by point radiality and the other is the Pontryagin class and basically the only if the fourth cohomology is torsion free then essentially the only invariant that you have left to get from the Pontryagin class is how divisible it is it so you can write the Pontryagin class as d times some primitive element of the cohomology group so what is that d So th those are just topological invariants. If oh, th those are just homeomorphism invariants of the seven manifold. But what we need in order to prove our results are, are some more subtle invariants. So first of all, we need have a generalization of the Ilskoipi invariant, which can detect different smooth structures. So the sort of classical Ilskoipi invariant of a seven manifold can take. Um, 28 different values and distinguish between 28 different smooth structures, but that only works when the first point jargon class is zero, which never happens for T2 manifolds. Um, but Dermot Crowley and I found a way to generalize this to the situation where the first point jargon class is non zero, uh, but then it might not distinguish between 28 different smooth structures, but only some smaller number. Then once you have a G2 structure, you can associate some homotopy and diffeomorphism invariants to that. So we can cook up two different invariants, one new, which takes values in Z mod 48, and also an integer invariant called, which we call Xi. And finally, we, there's an analytic refinement of the new invariant. So using, using spectral data of the torsion free G2 metric, one can define an integer that has the property that it when you reduce it modulo 48, you get this uh, homotopy invariant. Okay, so the, the next component is you know, being able to generate lots and lots of examples. So we can do that using twisted connected sum construction. And we can compute the topology quite well. So we can find a lot of two connected examples. And once we have two connected examples, then we can apply some classification theorems which are simplest to state if we assume that the cohomology groups are, fourth cohomology groups are torsion free. So basically, two close seven manifolds satisfying these hypotheses that um, the two connected and uh, torsion free fourth cohomology will be homeomorphic if and only if the third better numbers agree and the greatest divisors of the Pontryagin classes agree. If you want them to diffeomorphic, then that's equivalent to in addition requiring that uh, this generalized in is Kuiper invariant agrees. In many situations, that's uh, a vacuous condition. So if the first Pontry argon class doesn't have enough um, uh, enough isn't sufficiently divisible, then in fact the is Kuiper invariant can only take a single value. So in those situations, homeomorphism would be implied if you morphism. But in some in some situations, you can have different smooth structures on the same uh, topological manifold. And finally, if both the new invariant and the xi invariant agree, then you can find uh, then you can choose the diffeomorphism so that the pulling back one G2 structure gives you something that's homotopic to the other G2 structure. And again, this condition on Xi will be vacuous if the greatest divisor of the Pontryagin class is sufficiently small. So in many cases, actually the only thing you need to check is the new invariant. Um, any questions? Okay, then I'll move on to describing the twisted connected sum construction. So this was uh, 
as I mentioned, originally implemented by Alexei Kovalev in the early 2000s, uh, based on a suggestion by Simon Donaldson. And I investigated this further together with Alessio Cotti, Mark Haskins, and Tommaso Pacini. Uh, so we used it to generate more examples and study the topology in more detail. So the starting point of the construction is some complex algebraic data. So you start with two closed simply connected Kähler threefolds. You assume that inside those you can find some anti-canonical K3 divisors whose holomorphic uh, normal bundle is trivial. And you assume that you have the right kind of diffeomorphism between the K3, these K3 surfaces, where I will say more about what right kind means later. So given these scalar threefolds, you cut out a tubular neighborhood of the K3 divisors. So you get a manifold with boundary, and the boundary will then be the K3 divisor times a circle. If you multiply both of those um, real six-dimensional manifolds by a further circle, then the boundaries will be K3 times S1 times S1. So you glue two of the, those two such boundaries together using this uh, what right kind of diffeomorphism between the K3 surfaces. And then you do you swap the roles of the two circles. So each of these, um, the, when you look at the boundaries, they sort of have an internal circle coming from the boundary of V, and they have an external circle factor coming from having multiplied V by S by another circle. So you swap the roles of the two those two circle factors. And that's sort of the twisting in the twisted connected sum construction. Now, by an application of uh, the Tian Yao theorem, or a more precise version in this context um, that I proved with Mark Haskins and Hayo Hein, when you take this kind of closed scalar threefold and you cut out an anti-canonical K3 device, which is a normal bundle, then you can put an asymptotically cylindrical Calabi-R metric on that. When you have an asymptotically cylindrical, when you have a Calabi-R metric that has holonomy on a complex threefold that has holonomy SU3, SU3 is a subgroup of G2, so you can regard V times S1 as being sort of a reducible G2 manifold. It has holonomy contained in G2, but it doesn't have holonomy exactly G2. But if you choose the diffeomorphism carefully between these uh, th these K3 surfaces, then it's possible to glue together the two asymptotic cylindrical manifolds with holonomy containing G2 to get a metric with holonomy exactly G2 on a closed manifold. So here's a picture that illustrates this. So we cook up a pair of asymptotic cylindrical Calabi-R threefolds, V plus and V minus, each which has holonomy SU3. We in the middle, we have um, a K3 surface times an S1 factor. The K3 surface has holonomy SU2. You take these, each of these has an infinitely long cylinder sticking out of it, but you truncate those cylinders and then you glue those two truncated cylinders to each other. And provided that you have chosen uh, your diffeomorphism between the K3 surfaces appropriately, there will sort of be a small error in trying to glue these two cylinders together. So you, you patch together two, you have a torsion-free G2 structure on each part, you patch them together, the patching introduces a small error, so the, the G2 structure you get on the result will not be quite torsion-free, but then you have some analysis argument that says if you perturb it a little bit, then you will get a torsion-free uh, G2 structure, something that solves the PD that defines the holonomy G2 condition. Okay, so the next question is, how do you get these uh, closed Kähler threefolds with uh, an anti-canonical K3 device of a trivial normal bundle to start with? Well, if you start with any Fano threefold, then the anti-canonical devices in there will be, um, will be K3 surfaces. The problem is that the, um, they will not have trivial normal bundle. They will have some self-intersection. But basically what you can do is you, you take one of these K3 divisors and take itself into section, so or take an intersection of two different K3 divisors, and then you blow that up, and that kind of gets rid of the um, non-triviality of the normal bundle. 
So the simplest case would be simply start with your take your final threefold to be complex projective space. Um, inside there, you could look at the intersection of two quarter K3 devices. Uh, you you blow that intersection up to get a new complex threefold Z. And if you take the proper transform of one of the K3 devices that you intersected, then that will now have in upstairs, that will now be an anti-canonical device of a trivial normal bundle. So this is something you can do for any for any found for pretty much any founder threefold, you can you, you can get the right kind of uh, closed Keller threefold this way. A nice thing about uh, this particular example, starting from something as simple as P3, is that you have a very good understanding of precisely which K3 surfaces appear as um, as the anti-canonical divisors in in uh, these closed scalar threefolds. Because it's clear from the construction that you can start with any smooth quarter K3 surface. So you just need to have some K3 surface with an ample class of degree four that's not hyperelliptic. If uh, you start with another family of, of smooth founder threefolds, there are 105, uh, there's classification of founder threefolds, there are 105 different families, and all but two of those can be used to give building blocks this way. The, um, and you, you always have some, at least some understanding of which K3 surfaces uh, can appear as anti-canonical devices in these families, so that will be important later. But in order to apply the construction, you don't just need to have these two building blocks, you also need to figure out what the how to what kind of diffeomorphism between the K3 surfaces will uh, allow you to do the gluing. So let's think a little bit about that condition. So the, the term that we have for these kinds of diffeomorphisms in K3 surfaces is hyperkeller rotation. So each of your asymptotic cylindrical Calabias refolds has a Calabias structure. So that's something you can encode by a pair consisting of the Keller form and holomorphic three form. You, along the cylindrical end, you can sort of decompose the, the Keller form and the holomorphic three form. Um, it sort of has a product form. In, in this product, you have three distinguished two forms on the K3 surface. Um, and those three two forms on the K3 surface form a hyperkeller triple. So that means that if you take one plus i times another, you get a holomorphic two form, while the third one gives you a Keller form with respect to some complex structure. But if you permute the roles of these three things, the same statement will still be true. Anyway, once you have your asymptotic cylindrical Calabias structure on V, then you can cook up a torsion-free G2 structure on the product of that with S1 by taking sort of the, the coordinate differential in S1 wedged with the Keller form plus the real part of the holomorphic three form. That will give you uh, the right kind of three form to define uh, a G2 structure on this product V times S1. So now we want to choose the diffeomorphism between the K3 surfaces in such a way that when you look at the diffeomorphism between the asymptotic cylinders, that does that diffeomorphism in the K3 factors, swaps the two S1 factors, and reverses direction on the R factor, that, that should uh, match up the asymptotic limits of the torsion free G2 structures. And when you hack your way through that, when you, when you write the asymptotic limit of uh, these three forms phi in terms of this hyperkeller triple, then the upshot is that all you need is that the diffeomorphism between the K3 surfaces should pull back the Keller form of, um, of one to the real part of the holomorphic two form of the other. Oh, sorry, I, I, there should be some mi subscripts minus and plus here. So this should be omega i minus should get pulled back to omega j plus, omega j minus should get pulled back to omega i plus, and omega k minus should get pulled back to minus omega k plus. Anyway, that is the, the condition that we need. So this leads to the matching problem, which is how, how on earth do you arrange that you can find such a diffeomorphism? Any questions? Seems everything clear so far. 
Okay. Uh, excellent. All right. So in, in practice, you, you don't want to say, oh, well, I've got a closed KLS3 fold with an anti-canonical device here. I've got another one here. Can I find a hyper-KLS rotation between those two K3 surfaces? Rather, what you want to do is you want to work with families. So you have two families of blocks. For instance, a family of block could be all the things that you can obtain by blowing up uh, P3 in some intersection of two quartic K3s. That gives you a whole set of building blocks. And once you have two such sets of building blocks, you can ask, can I find some element in one set and some element in the other set that can be where I can find a hyperkeller rotation? However, you do also want to have a little bit of control on what output you get. So you want, if you want to have some idea of what the topology of the resulting G2 manifold is, then to start with, you want all the, in each set of building blocks, you want all the elements to have the same topology. So in practice, that might mean that you sort of take each set to be some like a deformation type of building blocks. And you also need to know something about how your hyperkeller rotation acts on the cohomology of the K3 surfaces. So part of this is that when you look at the image of the cohomology of the threefold Z in the cohomology of the K3 surface, uh, that should certainly be the same for all the elements of, uh, of your set of blocks. And secondly, how these two, um, so I'm calling these the polarizing lattices. How those two polarizing lattices are, are sort of lined up by the hyperkeller rotation is important for what the topology of result is. So for instance, when you when you work your way, if you want to compute the second cohomology of the twisted connected sum G to manifold that you get out, then when you run the Maivitori sequence, you have to find that this is the intersection of the pullback of one polarizing lattice with the other polarizing lattice. So that is certainly you, something you need to have some control of. If you if you don't know what that is, if you're not able to determine, prescribe what that is, you don't have no idea what the second cohomology of your theta manifold would be. So the reason I, I call this the polarizing lattice of my of my block is that um, this uh, this polarizing lattice must always be contained in the Picard lattice of the K3 surface. So the Picard lattice on my K3 surface is the, the integer points that I have type 1, 1 in the cohomology. Um, so the, the condition that your K3 surface sits inside um, in, inside this closed Keller threefold Z forces it, the Picard lattice of the K3 surface, to uh, contain uh, th this polarizing lattice N. So that gives you a constraint on what K3 surfaces can possibly appear there. So the modular space of all K3 surfaces has dimension has dimension 20, but if um, if my polarizing lattice has rank uh, three or something, then that means there's only a, a seven-dimensional subspace of the modular space of K3 surfaces that could possibly appear as anti-canonical divisor in that set of blocks. Um, now, trying to explain a little bit how to translate this problem into a way that you can solve it. So, if you have a, if you try to prescribe an isomorphism between the cohomologies of the K3 surfaces and ask, can I realize that by hyperkeller rotation? Then the way you can try to address this is to first think of this as a problem of, of working with the fixed copy of the K3 surface, of the K3 lattice, with uh, two distinguished sublattices. So the cohomology, second cohomology of a K3 surface always has this, the same, is, is always the same lattice. It's the unique unimodular lattice with signature, even unimodular lattice of signature 319. So each of these can individually always be identified with a fixed copy of such lattice. But if we have chosen isomorphism between them, then we can identify them in a compatible way. And when we identified each of the cohomology of each of the two K3 surfaces with our fixed lattice L, then that also means that the polarizing lattices, which sat inside here, also get embedded into L. Um, so 
given having chosen the isomorphism between the two K3 surfaces, we can think of that as yielding a pair of embeddings with the polarizing lattices into this fixed K3 lattice L. And that's well defined up to the action of the isometry group of the K3 lattice. So this is what I call the, the configuration of, um, of the hyperkeller rotation. So you can ask, so the, the way to rephrase the question is basically, if you have two sets of, of building blocks and you pick a configuration of, um, of the polarizing lattices, so if you pick a pair of embeddings of those polarizing lattices into the K3 lattice L, um, is it possible to realize this particular choice of configuration by a hyperkeller rotation. So if you can answer that question, then not only do you get some twisted connected some G2 manifolds, you also have enough information about the resulting G2 manifold that you can compute a lot about the topology. And um, the convenient thing, one convenient thing about this is that the configuration can be described in a very sort of simple way in terms of basically just in terms of a matrix. So if you want to if you want to describe a primitive sublattice of the K3 lattice L, then provided the rank of that sublattice is at most 11, then that's basically just determined by the by the form of the sublattice. So any any lattice with the right uh, signature can be primitively of rank less than or equal to 11 can be primitively embedded into the K3 lattice uh, in a unique way. So if you want to des describe the configuration, essentially what you need to do is you just write down a, a block matrix where in one block you have the intersection form of one polarizing lattice, in another block you have diagonal block you have the intersection form of the other polarizing lattice, and then you fill and then you complete that as symmetric matrix in some uh, suitable way. So now I want to the hyperkeller rotation condition is something that has to do with and these hyperkeller rotations are always going to be isometries. But you want to translate that into a condition that doesn't involve metrics. So you want to phrase it in terms of the sort of moduli theory of K3 surfaces instead. So a K3 surface, once you have chosen how to identify the cohomology of the K3 surface with a fixed copy of the K3 surface, that gives you a period. So the period two plane of this marked K3 surface uh, is just the two plane inside the, well, you take this K3 lattice, you tensor it with L, um, and inside there you get a, a two plane corresponding to the span of the real and imaginary parts of a holomorphic two form of the K3 surface. On the other hand, we also have some distinguished open cones which lie inside the sort of realification of the polarizing lattices. These distinguished open cones come from the Kähler cones of the closed th threefold that you started with. So if you want to have a hyperkähler rotation with a particular configuration, then you have that on the one hand, the cohomology class represented by omega plus i agrees with the cohomology class represented by omega ij. So on the one hand, that lies in the Kähler cone of z plus, but also a period point for the K through surface sigma minus. Um, and for the same reason, the intersection of the period point, the period two plane of uh, sigma plus and this uh, Kähler cone coming from Z minus must also be non-empty. And the intersection of the two period two planes must also be non-empty. So uh, kind of a necessary condition for being able to realize something by hyperkeller rotation is that each of these three sets is non-empty, but in fact, that's also a sufficient condition. So if you if you manage to cook up your diffeomorphism in such a way that these three sets are non-empty, then it's possible to choose the asymptotic cylindrical Calabiar structures on uh, these um, complex threefolds V plus and V minus, in such a way that your diffeomorphism becomes a hyperkeller rotation. So that's basically a combination of the Torelli theorem and this non-compact version of the Calabiar theorem, which allows you to realize. Uh, so the Calabiar theorem not only tells you that you can find Ricci flat Kähler metrics on 
your complex manifold and certain condition. This also tells you that any Cayley class can be realized by those Ricci flat metrics. So the point here is that we've basically reduced the problem to something that doesn't involve metrics, it only involves complex algebraic geometry. Everything, all you need to know is something about these periods, which is determined just by the complex structure of the K3 surface. And you need to know something about the Kähler cones of the complex threefolds and what their image in the cohomology of the K3 surfaces. So this allows you to reduce the, the matching problem to something about understanding, something about being able to embed certain, being able to find sufficiently generic K3 surfaces as anti-canonical devices in a set of blocks. So this, this may look slightly technical, but basically if you start out with a configuration, so we have our sets of blocks, each of them has a polarizing lattice, we choose a way to embed both of those into the fixed copy of the K3 lattice. We can look at the orthogonal complement to one of these polarizing lattices inside the other, and then we can take the orthogonal complement of that inside the sum of the two lattices. So that gives us an over lattice of uh, one of the polarizing lattices. Now, if you have realized your configuration by hyperkähler rotation, then omega j plus and omega k plus must both be orthogonal to this lattice lambda that I cooked up here. So that means that, oops, so that means that the, the K3 surface sigma plus always has this, uh, must always contain this lattice. So choosing the configuration determines the lattice such that if I can realize my configuration by hyperkähler rotation, then the Picard lattice of the K3 surfaces must contain that lattice. So the upshot is that to have any chance of finding a matching with a given configuration, it must be possible to find at least some K3 surfaces. Um, so in, in, each, in each set of blocks, it must be possible to at least find some blocks such that the K3 surface there is sort of lambda polarized. Um, but this tends to be sort of an all or nothing deal. If you, if you can, sometimes there can be a genuine obstruction to finding a sort of lambda polarized K3 surface among your set of blocks. But if there is no genuine obstruction, then probably you can actually find a generic uh, lambda polarized K3 surface. And one can, there's an argument one can make that provided that the generic lambda polarized K3 surface does appear among your set of blocks, then one can in fact also find a matching. Okay, so how does one cook up these genericity properties? Well, if you start with, if you make this construction of a building block that comes from starting with the final threefold, blowing up the intersection of two anti-canonical devices, then you automatically have this generic, genericity property provided that lambda is actually equal to n. So this comes from, uh, this is a result of Bovi. Um, and the same holds if you consider a certain weaker class of uh, complex threefolds that we call semifano. So these are threefolds with the canonical divisor uh, is semi-small. So it, the, the morphism defined by the anti-canonical class is allowed to contract curves to points and divisors to curves, but not allowed to do, contract divisors to, to points. So I said here that we, given the configuration, we could cup this over lattice to, to N. If that is exactly equal to N, then, we, the, then we're going to get this generosity property whenever we start with, uh, whenever the sets of blocks that we use come from blowing up finite threefolds or semi finite threefolds this way. So this kind of allows you to mass produce lots of matchings, and that way you can mass produce uh, lots of twisted connected sum GT manifolds. Because it's very easy to construct examples of configurations where lambda is equal to n. Basically, whenever you take the simplest way to define a configuration, 
is to just take the orthogonal direct sum of your two um, of two polarizing lattices and then embedding that in the K3 lattice using Nicolin's results. So I said that to define basically to describe the configuration, I said you need to need to write down this block matrix. We have the polar, they have the insection form of n plus in one diagonal block and the insection form of n minus in the other diagonal block. And then you have to fill in something in the off diagonal box. So if you just fill in zero in the off diagonal box, then then that always works. And then lambda will just be equal to n. And so you can uh, then you can do your matching. So you can you can generate thousands of sets of building blocks using this result. And they can then be matched together in lots of different ways. So you can get sort of order of hundreds, a hundred million examples without really trying that hard. Um, and when you do this, when you sort of do things the easiest possible way, then actually these examples turn out to be too connected. So you can then apply your classification results and you, you sort of find that among these hundred million examples, actually you just keep getting the same few hundred smooth closed seven manifolds over and over again. One interesting thing you can get out of all these examples is you can, for instance, find some twisted connected sums that are diffeomorphic to total spaces of S1 bundles. So that might be something you didn't expect maybe because uh, G2 manifolds can't, there can be no continuous symmetries of the, the actual G2 metric, but it, it may, this shows that you, the underlying manifold can well have uh, sort of continuous symmetries. But nevertheless, um, one downside of, of this mass production is that actually all these invariants that, uh, that I said I want to use to distinguish some, detect some interesting phenomena, they actually always take the same value whenever you construct your, your G to manifold as a twisted connected sum with this uh, kind of orthogonal configuration. Now, if you look at uh, the new invariant or this analytic refinement new bar, then that, that never sort of takes interesting values for any twisted connected sum, even if you, even if you allow non-perpendicular configurations. But if one, one can also use non-perpendicular matchings, the problem is that then you have to, the lambda plus will be a strict over lattice of N, and so you have to prove some harder generosity result than what's provided by this general argument above V. E. So you have to sort of figure something out by hand. So as an example, the set of blocks I described by blowing up uh, complex projective space in the intersection of two cortex, you can say that any any K3 surf if you any K3 surface with um, Polarizing a generic K3 surface with a, whose Picard lattice contains lambda will appear as a K3 device in there, provided that lambda contains a degree four class, and there is no class that's orthogonal to that degree four class that squares to minus two, and there's no class that squares to zero that has in a product two with that degree four class. So basically, that's because having a degree four class ensures that your K3 surface will embed as a quartic in P3. Ruling out uh, these minus two classes ensures that your this uh, embedding, this map to P3 does not uh, contract any points to nodes, uh, does not contract any curves to nodes. And um, ruling, the, ruling out uh, the existence of classes squaring to zero, pairing to two with the degree four class means that your K3 surface is not hyperelectric. Um, so that, that's a simple situation where you can sort of prove improved uh, generosity results. And uh, for more complicated examples, you can still prove something like that, but it gets you have to do more and more work by hand. Um, the, the more complicated your the finer three folds you start with are. Anyway, the payoff of doing this work, sort of proving some generosity results by hand, to sort of handcraft matchings, is that. Now the Eoscorpion invariant and this other homotopy invariant of G2 structures can take different values. So you can use the twisted connected sum construction to exhibit examples where of G2 pairs of G2 manifolds that are homeomorphic 
but where the diffeomorphism types are distinguished by the generalized Scorpio invariant. And you can also find examples of GT manifolds where mod components of the modular space are distinguished by this homotopy invariant Xi. Um, any questions? Right. So the option was that in order to define these kinds of examples, we really had to do this uh, extra work of uh, proving improved generosity results. Because if we didn't do that, then we would all these invariants would not be able to distinguish different twisted connected sums. But what about the new invariant and its analytic refinement? Well, so that that's always takes the same value for any twisted connected sum, whether you sort of use a whether they're mass produced or handcrafted or not. Um, but we came up with a more complicated version of a twisted connected sum construction where new and new bar can actually take different values. So let's go back and if you if all this talk about K3 moduli theory uh, put you to sleep, then you might possibly consider waking up now because I'm going to talk about some sort of very elementary geometry of, of two tori now, which is relevant for um, for how to make the, get some extra mileage out of the, the, the construction. So we started with a with a building block, so a, a closed Keller threefold with an anti-canonical K3 divisor with trivial normal bundle. When we cut out the that K3 divisor, we get an open complex threefold that we could put an S plus cylindrical Calabiao metric on, such that the cylindrical end is of the form R times circle times the K3 surface. And we think of this circle factor as being the internal circle factor. Now, suppose that your building block, you know something more about the building block, that it has a cyclic automorphism group that acts trivially on the K3 divisor. So when you look at the action of that automorphism group on V and the cylindrical end of V, then that means that it will act as a product on this cylinder, fixing the R factor and fixing the K3 factor, but acting as a rotation on the internal circle factor. So if you now take this cyclic group and also let it act on an external circle, then when you multiply V by this external circle and take the quotient, then that will be, here you have a, a strut cylindrical manifold with torsion free GT structure. You act on it by a finite group, which has no fixed points, but it acts freely on the external circle. So this will be a smooth asymptotic cylindrical GT manifold. And the asymptotic end of that will now be K3 surface times two torus times R, where the two torus is the quotient of the internal circle and the external circle divided by this cyclic automorphism group. But while this quotient is um, two torus, it does, you started out with something that was a metric product of two circles, but this quotient does not have to be a metric product of two circles. In fact, the geometry of this two torus depends on what circumferences you chose for the internal circle factor and the external circle factor, and you can basically choose those to be whatever you want. So the, the extra twisted connected sum construction is you start with some building blocks that have some automorphism groups, possibly one or both of these could be could be trivial. But then having chosen those automorphism groups, you can then adjust the circumferences of the internal and external circle factors to adjust the geometry of the tori on the two sides. And if you chose those circumferences appropriately, then maybe you can find an isometry between those two tori. And once you found chosen your isometry between the torus factors, then you try to find uh, diffeomorphism between the K3 factors that makes this an isomorphism between the asymptotic limits of the G destructors. If that happens, then you can glue much the same as uh, in the ordinary twisted connected sum construction. So in the ordinary twisted connected sum construction, you kind of didn't really have very much flexibility in what this uh, isometry within the torus factors should look like. So you could, what we did was we just flipped the roles of the internal and external. So even if we adjust the circumferences of the of the two factors, the only way that the only 
is uh, topologically essentially the the only asymmetry we can get is this flip map. So the the key parameter here is the angle between the external circle directions when you match things together, and this will or is forced to always be a right angle, pi divided by two. And that sort of turns out to be the culprit for why the new invariant always takes the same value for all twisted connected sums. But once you <clears throat> once you have these finite automorphism groups floating around, then you can get more exciting possibilities for the for the gluing angle. You can have more exciting torus isometries. So one of the simplest examples would be you could have a trivial automorphism group on one side. So here you just have a you choose the circumferences of the internal and external, so you just get a square lattice basically. And then on the other side, you take also choose the circumferences of the internal and external factors to be equal, but square root of two times the circumferences that you had on the other side. So then when you divide by an automorphism group uh, of order two, you, you now get the fundamental domain can still be taken to be a square of the same size as the fundamental domain on the other side. So that you can choose an isometry between these two, tori, but the isometry will now no longer put the external circle factors at right angles, but rather it will have angle pi divided by four or three pi divided by four or something like that. Um, another possibility, if you have divided by involutions on both sides, is by taking one circle factor to have length square root of three times the other one, you can ensure that the fundamental domain on of the torus on each side is a hexagon, and you can find an isometry between them that makes an angle like two pi divided by three. Um, but you can also make things even more complicated. So for instance, if you take uh, one automorphism group to be have order three and the other to have order four, you can get arc cos of one divided by square root of six as a possible gluing angle. So things can get really quite complicated. So once you have chosen the size of the automorphism groups, it's essentially just a combinatorial problem to determine how many isometries between the two tori there are. So for the three and four, you can have 28 possibilities. Once you've chosen this torus isometry, then you try to figure out how do I cook up a diffeomorphism of K3, what's the condition on the K3 surfaces to match up the asymptotes cylindrical G2 structures. And you can turn this into a problem about configurations of polarizing lattices again. So this naturally problem is much the same as before, it's just that before the easy case where you didn't have to do any work by hand on generalistic results was when the polarizing lattices were arranged at the right angle. Now instead you try, the easy case would be if the polarizing lattices are at, at an angle equal to the uh, gluing angle, this angle between the external circle factors from the torus isometry. And uh, it's not guaranteed that it's, it's, there's not guaranteed that there's any way to fill in the off diagonal terms when you try to describe your configuration by this uh, block um, matrix, there's no, no guarantee that you can fill in the off diagonal terms to realize uh, the particular angle that you want. Um, so the last few comments I want to make is, so how do you get some building blocks with uh, these automorphism groups? Well, one way is you could do basically what we had before about blowing up um, a Fano threefold, but if you're, but just make sure that your Fano threefold is actually a branched cover over another Fano threefold. And what's the payoff from this? Well, by using just a, a small number of, of building blocks, um, with these kinds of automorphisms, um, and the, it's harder to it's harder to find these blocks with automorphisms. But using just a few blocks with automorphisms, you can make um, quite a lot of matchings because there are, there's more flexibility in the possibilities for the torus isometries. So when you compute the invariance of these extra twisted connected sums, then actually the new invariant in the new bar invariant can take many different values and so you can use this to find examples with uh, with disconnected moduli space where the the moduli space is sort of 
the components are distinguished by the values of nu or by this analytic refinement. Um, and I think that's probably where I stop.